Good evening, everyone. Welcome to York Observatory Stella 2, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. We're broadcasting live from the Allen I. Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Teletrip broadcasts every Wednesday night at 7.30 local Toronto time. And for any questions or comments you have about our past shows, or if you have any suggestions for future topics, um, please uh, send us an email at observe at yorku.ca. You can also connect with us on Twitter or Instagram with the handle at York Observatory and Facebook at Alan I. Carswell Ops. I am Matt, and I'll be one of your hosts this evening, along with Shannon and Tina. Uh, tonight, we have an awesome episode uh, in our AMA series, or Ask Me Anything, with Professor Elena Hyde, the new director of the Alan I. Carswell Observatory. But before we get started with our main show, uh, we want to give you a little update on what you can see this coming week. So this week, we have the planet Uranus. NGC 1499, the Pleiades, Vega, and Capella visible in the night sky. Capella is actually known as the Goat Star because of the meaning of its name in Latin. But we've talked about this star on our past shows, so I wanted to focus on something that really intrigued me this time, NGC 1499. The reason why NGC 1499 sounded special to me is the way it got its name, the California Nebula. And it is a southern nebula in the night sky, an emission nebula. It is located in the constellation of Perseus, and it is uh, and it happens to resemble a lot to the shape of California, the, the state in the United States. And that's the reason why it actually got that name, California Nebula. And now that we're getting into names, let's test your knowledge on Greek and Roman mythology. So Uranus is known by us as the seventh planet in the, our solar system. And its name comes from the Greek mytholo mythology, where uh, Uranus is the god of the sky. He is the great grandfather of the god of war, Eris, or as the Romans called him, Mars, and the, gr the grandfather of Zeus, who has also another planet in the solar system named after him, Jupiter. And if we continue with the timeline, uh, Uranus is the father of the Titan Cronus who also happens to have its name on a planet, Saturn. And if you didn't know, the sun has also a name in Greek mythology. He's the Titan Helios. Uh, reason why the heliocentric theory, the theory that revolutionized the ancient world by saying the earth was the one revolving around the sun and not the opposite way has that name, Helios, heliocentric. And now that we know all this, let's get into the main part of this episode and introduce our guest. Go ahead, Tina. So our guest today is obviously Professor uh, Elena Hyde. Professor Hyde's research is in and above the clouds, combining astrophysics, data science, cloud computing, planetary sciences, optical engineering, telescope operations, and telescope observations. Her primary astrophysical research focus is galactic archaeology. She has worked with instrumentation and telescopes around the world. And of course, her experience enables her to provide technical leadership for York University's Allen I. Carswell Astronomical Observatory. Another motivation for her is the promotion of astrono astronomy education and research through public telescope activities and exploration. As a lecturer, trainer, and consultant, she innovates teaching methodologies for interdisciplinary audiences across the sciences, as well as for businesses students, and the general public. Prior to starting at York, Professor Hyde went from the University of Arizona in the US to a Marie Curie Fellowship at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, a master's in the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and finally a PhD at Macquarie University in Australia. This was followed by positions as research support astronomer International Telescope Support Office, Information Officer and Instructor, as well as private sector roles as trainer and consultant in data science and work as a certified Google Cloud trainer and Google Cloud engineer. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hyde, the new director of the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. 
Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, <laughs> I suppose I don't really have anything I can add to that other than uh, it's wonderful to be here. And of course, I'm always happy to, uh, to you know, talk to everybody about astronomy and engineering and all that good stuff. So over to you all to uh, ask me anything here tonight. Well, uh, hello, Professor Hyde, and uh, thank you for the amazing introduction, Matt and Tina. Um, so the first question I want to ask you is, as a young child, did you always want to study astronomy? Um, I don't really remember, actually. That's a good question. I know that as a kid, um, I, I do re recall that I was at one point rather obsessed with the Little House on the Prairie books. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, I would regularly go about and make um, uh, adventures and explorations and, uh, you know, um, traps, apparently, according to my mom. Uh, so I don't know if that's carried on into astronomy, um, but I, I, uh, I spend a lot of time doing a lot of very different things. And when I was in uh, high school, I started taking night classes at a community college in uh, in Oregon, and uh, yeah, I got my first ever uh, observational astronomy sort of class in a planetarium when I was about 15, and uh, I thought, you know, this is just really interesting, and uh, then I had to learn a bunch of math. <laughs> So uh, it was actually a little bit of a journey for me to get into astronomy, starting off as I did doing uh, all kinds of other things. I did a lot of odd jobs and um, repaired uh, various things across uh, um, mechanical and um, uh, electrical engineering sorts of things. Uh, but yeah, I eventually wandered around and uh, long enough to figure out that astronomy was pretty interesting and I transferred over to Arizona for an undergrad degree where I just uh, had a ton of fun looking through lots and lots and lots of telescopes and uh, that really got me addicted. So if you want to know about getting started in astronomy, for me it all started with being able to do observing on um, astronomical quality telescopes and things like the Bach telescope on Kitt Peak in Arizona and getting that data across from the stars uh, in, you know, quote unquote, real time. It just is, it's still absolutely thrilling to me, which is actually, you know, one of the, my favorite things about the one meter telescope is how easy it is to get data on that telescope at York. So I feel like coming back, uh, coming, coming to York, it, even though it's, um, was someplace I'd never lived in before, I've a little bit come full circle <laughs> coming back to observational astronomy and telescopes, which I, um, yeah, just, I really love getting that live imaging view. It's just too, too bad it's cloudy tonight or we'd be doing some for sure. 100% and I can see why you're so passionate about the one meters um, with the point that you did start loving astronomy with uh, observing. So for the future astronomers, listening. Um, in your opinion, in order to study astronomy, what steps did you take from a young age to either like high school or undergraduate to be where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few things that I really wish I had known. Um, I, uh, as I said, I sort of wandered through a little bit. I did a lot of art and uh, French classes and foreign languages and philosophy. Um, and I got all the way to to Arizona. And if you transfer universities, uh, a lot of times they'll let you transfer in at whatever level you think you ought to be in. So I transferred into um, a third year um, undergraduate without any form of calculus whatsoever. So I didn't have differential equations. I didn't have vector calc. I got into my classes and I said, what are the upside down triangles? So I would say definitely do not do that. <laughs> if at all possible, take the math and statistics that you need uh, sooner <laughs> rather than later. Um, and the, you know, if, if it's available to you, that's wonderful. Uh, right now we have a, a huge advantage in that a lot of the statistics and mathematics classes are now available for free online through things like Khan Academy, in the Stanford Free Online um, uh, Online Academy, and uh, all those math classes are now out there. And it's one of the few things I really, really wish that I had 
had access to and been able to learn about when I was younger, um, because it really helps so much to have that math and statistics background. And of course, programming, um, a programming language. So much like any other language, um, once you start learning them, you become more adept in them, you can become uh, more flexible with them, you can write paragraphs, express yourself, and being able to do that across uh, um, several computer languages, especially now Python, is incredibly important because um, you, it's very, very hard to do anything in astronomy at the moment without data science skills, without computing skills, without distributed computing skills. So all of those things are, are things that you can pick up easily in an afternoon if you have uh, any kind of computer access. And most of them are now actually available for free online. And, you know, of course, when I was younger, I had uh, dial up internet <laughs> um, when we eventually had internet. But for most of uh, my, my early career in high school, I had a uh, rather old um, typewriter. <laughs> so it was not conducive to learning, uh, learning programming languages. Um, and, you know, there the first uh, back in the olden times our first computers were things that had things like word processing and it wasn't terribly easy to get access to computer languages and stuff like that so my main advice for students now is because it's so easy to get online and so easy to get into things like python tutorials there are actually python um, learning uh, games that you can play that will teach you python as you go and you can do it for free so you don't even have to have a computer that actually has processing power you can actually use things like uh, colab which are a jupyter notebook run through an internet browser so even if you can only use the computers at your library um, you can still open up an internet browser and run Python code and write Python code and learn, you know, all kinds of valuable skills. So all of those things are, are probably on my list of, of stuff I would recommend, especially to, to younger folks who are looking to start out. And if you're just getting started, the sooner you start programming and the sooner you start learning math and statistics, the better off you will be. You definitely do not want to leave those until you're in your undergrad, <laughs> because otherwise you get a very nasty surprise and a whole lot of um, a whole lot of sleepless nights. Hundred percent, and I completely agree. Like even to me, it was surprising how much math and uh, programming goes into astronomy. It's not just observing. Um, so on that topic as well, um, about your education, did you always plan to do your master's and your PhD? And what is your advice for students who want to do more than just your undergraduate studies? Yeah, that's a, a great point. So I, um, I don't know that I can say that I, I necessarily planned to do a master's and a PhD. Most of my, my interest as an undergrad was to, to see if I could find a way uh, to make a wage in astronomy. <laughs> Uh, most of the, uh, you know, jobs that I held for a long time were um, things like I said, you know, odd jobs sort of work or selling artwork and various other activities. Um, and so I was actually not making a lot of money or any real funds in astronomy until I started doing undergraduate research. And uh, once I got into that, I said, oh, well, actually, if you go into a master's degree, um, overseas, especially, there are some that are fully funded. And so I found a fully funded master's program in Germany where they actually had a, a really, really reasonable living wage. They, um, they had a stipend for computers. They had health care. They had all kinds of great stuff. So I actually went into it because I could see a, um, an economic path forward, shall we say. Um, and uh, once I was there, I, I, you know, I found out that actually I, I, I wanted to do a second master's in uh, in astrophysics, so I went to the Netherlands, and it sort of each thing led to another. But all along the way, um, there's always other options as well. So, you know, if I if I was, you know, thinking about going into industry or data science or consulting or banking or finance, all of those things I could have done if I had. Uh, a bit more computing programming experience. Um, what I was qualified for actually was optical engineering because I also did engineering and, and planetary sciences. And if you're thinking of going into, into um, 
uh, engineering careers, uh, optical engineering is actually a great way to go. Um, but none of those are necessarily going to need a master's degree or a PhD. So if you don't really want to be doing the research behind a master's or a PhD, I always tell people like, look, have, have a look and see what really interests you in particular, and then go for that path, because that's what's going to get you where you want in the end. Uh, but if you are thinking, hey, I really want to stay in research, try to find a research program somewhere in the world that is doing what you want to do and will pay you for it because there are a lot of positions out there that have uh, master's positions especially that are not particularly um uh, not particularly well funded and I, I can still remember when i got my first results back from my phd applications only about 60 percent of the positions i was offered were actually paid positions um, so you have to watch out for that as well um, but casting a wide net and really looking for what is is going to match your research interests the most strongly will allow you to write the really passionate letters of recommendation and showcase um, a really well-developed portfolio because that will be what you're really interested in. So if you're going to go for more than just undergraduate studies, make sure it's something that you really, really love. And thank you, Professor Hyde. Um, now, Tina, we have some questions for you on your career. Hi, Professor. How did you come to York? And what does your job entail on a day to day basis? Oh, that's a great question. So um, uh, we uh, this <laughs> how did I get to York is actually a little bit of a long question because it's actually how did I get to Canada? Um, and, uh, you know, how I got to Canada was what I term as one of the longest trips around the world ever. <laughs> so as I mentioned before, I had, I had started out in, in, in Oregon, I went to Arizona, uh, then, you know, moved to, uh, to Germany. I spent some time in France. I moved to the Netherlands, uh, moved to Australia. I became an Australian. <laughs> so I'm actually an Australian citizen. I got my PhD and I was casting around for jobs using kind of the method I mentioned before, looking for things I was really, really passionate about. And um, finding the position with the one meter telescope that had telescope access, it had engineering, it had observing, it had optical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, data reduction, data collection, data warehousing, there's everything going on here. So I saw this position, I just said, this is amazing. This is literally a list of everything I've ever done, I have to come to York. And fortunately, the university agreed, and they, um, they wanted me to come for an interview. But from Australia, it's very, very difficult to get people to come into Canada for an interview. So I was actually in um, the Google Next conference in San Francisco because I got sent there on a contract. And because I had gotten to California, York was able to pull me up. Uh, uh, up for I believe exactly three days and two nights to uh, to Toronto, and so I was able to uh, to sort of squish in the interview and make it up to Toronto um, for a very 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 fast trip, and then fly all the way back to. Uh, Australia. So I made my interview and um, and then of course I had to actually move from Australia to Canada, which was not particularly well timed because we were I was only here for a few months before of course the pandemic lockdown started. Um, but we got here, uh, me and my partner and um, and uh, you know it's been really really wonderful despite every, the the challenges. But it's uh, it's it it is. As I say, you know, um, it's it's uh, it's part about the part about the destination, but the uh, the destination is the journey. I'm not sure I'm saying that quote right, but that's a bit how it was. And right now, as director, what my main job is is to keep the observatory functioning on all possible levels for outreach, for research, for our students, and for any kind of class support that we can do. So if anything breaks, tell me right away. <laughs> and um, I'll just say we did get a related question. I um, I got uh, over on the uh, the YouTube chat that actually kind of relates back to what I mentioned about the um, 
the Netherlands and uh, Germany and and Europe is one thing you do find when you start changing around is that um, you end up learning a lot of languages. <laughs> so not just computing languages, but spoken languages as well. And uh, I, I found an interesting thing traveling around is some languages are much easier uh, for some people than for others. So I moved to Germany and um, I thought, oh, this would be fine. I had no problem learning French. French was easy, so German's gonna be easy too. And it was so hard. <laughs> I really had a lot of trouble with the German language and using it and expressing it. And then I moved to the Netherlands and I thought, oh no, it's, it's Dutch, it's gonna be so hard. It's gonna be like German, but actually it was really easy. So um, when I was in both of those countries, most of the institutes were fairly international. So they had a cross between written in English and uh, written in sort of German or French or, or Dutch. And it was quite nice because you, uh, you find you can express yourself twice, once in each language, and it, it, it adds a little bit of context to what you're saying. But um, most of my research papers were in English, so that helped a lot. I was able to do my master's in the Netherlands um, uh, with a, a Dutch statement at the end, which I'm still very, very proud of. So thanks to Sergey for that um, uh, the question on YouTube, actually. So <laughs> just, to, just to kind of round that question off, hopefully. All right, thank you. Speaking of languages, a different type of language, actually, you mentioned earlier that programming languages are key to the field. So which programming languages do you feel are most useful to an undergraduate astronomy student. I'll, I'll actually just extrapolate this and say anyone from science, uh, Python is the go-to language because one of the advantages in the Python language is that you can literally call and compile almost any other program. So my C codes, I can call from Python, run run uh, from my Python code, extract the results, and then have the rest of the, um, the code in, in a Python notebook. My Fortran code runs in Python. My IDL code, well, it still needs the access uh, license, but it runs through Python. So you can call all of these other languages and run through it. And you can also use one of the most powerful uh, database data warehousing languages, which is SQL or SQL. And this is one that I really recommend for, for flexibility especially if you're going to be working with data. So if you're thinking, well, um, I'm not going to work with any data, I'm going to be a pure uh, theoretician that only does the equations and never collects any data, <laughs> maybe you don't, you don't need SQL. But if you're ever going to collect data at all, you need somewhere to store it. So you actually need a data warehouse. You need to know what a data warehouse is, how to access it. Um, how to set up a database, and that's where SQL comes in. So if any of you have ever thought, oh, I might go get some, some data off of the, um, the SDSS website or something, um, they'll actually ask you to type it in a SQL query, which is um, you know, its own query language. And it's, it's actually fairly human readable. So if you're learning Python and SQL together, they actually mesh uh, extremely well. And most modern cloud databases, so you've heard of like Google and Amazon, they have storage facilities that you can access through uh, SQL code, which is usually then called back through a Python notebook. So learning Python and SQL together are 100% um, my, my top two um, just science and general languages. And then on top of that, of course, there's other things that will add um, a little bells and whistles. So uh, R language, which is just um, capital R, if you haven't heard of it, it's, it's actually very similar to Python, but it has slightly higher accuracy on some statistical tests. Um, and you've got you know, a whole range of other other things you can run for if you need it for a very specific purpose, like a C++, for example. Um, but yes, it all comes back down to uh, to Python and SQL, and I would absolutely stand by that for any introduction to, to programming. Great, perfect. And finally, what is your favorite type of observation aside from visible spectrum telescopes? For example, is it radio telescopes? And do you have a favorite observatory? 
Oh, well, I, I think I have to say York, York Observatory for my favorite observatory, or I, I sort of would lose my, my director's label. Um, but uh, my favorite type of observation, um, aside from visible wavelength telescopes, is actually a little bit of a hard choice. I, I do love radio telescopes. I got a chance to observe with the Westerbork telescope in the Netherlands. Um, but the, uh, the Fourier transforms have never been quite easy. I, I think, you know, I would go probably for, um, gosh, I would, my next best guess would be submillimeter because it's such an interesting wavelength range to, to try to observe in. And the instrumentation behind it has always been really, really interesting to me. I haven't had a chance to do a lot of submillimeter observing, um, but I, I've always been, uh, I, I've always found it really, really fun. So um, aside from visible wavelength, so that, that, that knocks off all the photometry and uh, imaging that we do at York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and it, I'm assuming this also doesn't count spectroscopy because spectroscopy um, will of course get you a, a huge amount of data off of your objects. Uh, and if you're going for a favorite type of observation, one thing that, that uh, might be kind of fun to consider is, of course, if you get a chance to get data yourself, I would always recommend this for um, for science and for students and for any any kind of process at all, really, because you can always query databases. And we talked about programming languages earlier. Um, a really easy way to to query lots of databases is actually to use the Top Topcat server, which you can download. It's for free, so I, I will only recommend free things to people ever. But <laughs> the Topcat will allow you to pull off of catalogs. Um, some of these catalogs are incredibly, incredibly large. So you can search thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stars. But there's something very special about getting your own observations, planning the observations, finding out when the object is up, setting the parameters of the observation, going out and getting the data, and then reducing it yourself. Um, so I would say rather than specifying maybe a wavelength, um, the, your the best observations or my favorite observations have always been the ones that I've been able to do myself. Um, and that's true of any telescope, really. And uh, as far as favorite telescopes, I, I do have to pick York Observatory. <laughs> it's a, um, a, a close a second to York would be the Bach telescope on Kitt Peak, uh, just because it was so lovely to use. Very insightful. <laughs> And thank you for picking York, obviously. Um, now, Matt has a few questions for you. Uh, thank you, Tina. Thank you for, for that. And those were some really good questions uh, and really helpful for me as well, being a, a physics and astronomy student. And first of all, congratulations on uh, Professor Heidel on becoming the new director of our observatory. And could, could you tell us more about this? What are your expectations and what goals and objectives do you have for the observatory, including a door in the warm room and a cup of coffee? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I, I recall this. I did, I did promise I'd tell you the story about the coffee in the warm room. So as the incoming director, I, I have to take on the responsibility that the observatory at York has a warm room that has has historically not been very warm. Um, so I, I did set up a, a bit of a bet with the outgoing director that I could install a door for less than $50. Um, and that, that door is now in existence. So it's actually a, um, uh, you might have seen them on uh, um, your favorite hardware store. They're sort of Velcro attachable uh, magnetic um, thermal doors and you can you can take it down right now in the summertime it's so hot you want as much airflow as possible so you can just peel it down and then you paste it up in the summer and it claps closed and keeps the uh the warm room at uh maybe not extremely warm but not frozen temperatures and uh, this came about because the first winter i was in canada um which was uh not this last winter but the one before that <laughs> Um, it was so cold that when I went up to the observatory with my notebook and my pen, I couldn't use my pen because it was 
it was too actually too cold for the ink to flow for my pen. So I was like, well, my pen is frozen and I'm frozen. Um, so this needs to change. And uh, yes, I, I bet the outgoing director, Paul Delaney, a cup of Tim's coffee that I could get that uh, that thermal door up and we have it now. So I have won myself a, uh, a Tim's coffee. <laughs> and for those of you watching who are not in Canada, Tim's is short for Tim Hortons, which is one of my favorite discoveries of Canada since moving here. So other than, of course, setting up doors, I'm really, really keen to continue our, our online presence and continue live imaging across to, uh, across to YouTube, continue setting up cloud databases for all the observatory observations and making us you know, more accessible, uh, easier to find. And as the pandemic lifts, I'm really, really looking forward to beginning in-person observing once again at the, at the telescope. Um, and we're looking at making a couple really big improvements over the next year, which I'm really excited about. The, the, uh, the building is a little bit old, and um, I, I'm not sure if we're at the final approval stage on funding, so I can't exactly say just yet, but we have some really, really big um, improvements headed towards the uh, the observatory, uh, the building as well as putting in actual museum displays around the telescopes so people can interact with things and um, just have a really nice uh, experience up in the domes. So it's a lot of fun stuff headed our way. And of course, I have to mention, we're going to be doing the 2024 um, total solar eclipse, which is coming so close to Toronto. Um, and that, that, that uh, um, it's maybe not an expectation, but it's something I'm really, really looking forward to. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you about that. And, and I'm pretty sure I know what the surprise is, but I, I ke I'll keep it a surprise. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just not sure we're at the uh, the final level of approval from the university. So I don't want to get anyone's hopes up, yeah. <laughs> but um, big improvements coming soon and over the next over the next year, as soon as we can, we'll be sending out lots and lots of uh, announcements. Hopefully by this time next year, we'll be able to do all in-person stuff. We can have a big party at the telescope. Oh, that would be amazing for sure. And well, my last question would be, uh, is there anything else you would like to say to all the people watching our live broadcast, especially to the ones that are pursuing astronomy as their path in life? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, um, just in terms of, of general advice, I would say, you know, always try to, um, to find your your path that is you know going to be most interesting to you it's it always ends up being just a little bit more bizarre than you might have thought um you know when you first uh when you first start off um some of us start off from an early age um you know stargazing some of us start off with all kinds of different paths like i said you know i was um you know really inspired by uh by art and did a lot of odd jobs and uh you know i actually used to do gas welding and arc welding and all kinds of crazy stuff and evolved into a real interest in um, in engineering and astronomy and how it all fits together so when you're putting together your own path following you know the parts that interest you the most will um, have the best chance of success because whenever you're going off into a career, whether it's astronomy or otherwise, if you can express genuine interest in that, um, you're much more likely to get that position than somebody else who comes in and says, well, I, I technically qualify. <laughs> so, you know, as someone who's, I've sort of seen a, a couple of threads through, you know, business and science and, um, you know, people who've, who've gone into PhD programs and people who've chosen to go into industry. And in all cases, it's when they could find the part of that that was really, really interesting to them. Um, and, you know, the, the um, you know, if you've got a, a real love of science and astronomy and astrophysics, you you know, you find that you you reach out for that path. And in my case, it was um, being willing to to travel and being willing to change countries, being willing to change uh, locations. And I actually didn't think that I would end up 
in uh, in Canada. Like I said, I was in Australia. I did my PhD in Australia. I became Australian and got my citizenship. I was there for 10 years and I thought I'm never going to leave Australia. Um, and I saw this position and I just like, this was perfect. This is exactly what I should be doing. And by following that, I ended up at a amazing university with a wonderful observatory. And of course, by this, I mean the York Observatory. And I'm working with great people, um, all of our co-hosts here tonight, for example. And, uh, you know, it requires, of course, a lot of, a lot of hard work and dedication. But, um, you know, when you're reaching for that, that uh, you know, that passion, a lot of times you can find things that you you wouldn't normally look for. And so, you know, sometimes you're thinking, oh, well, you know, I can't, um, I can't get funding for uh, a regular stipend, but I can get um, student financial aid, or I can get a work study paid position, or I can get, um, you know, some, some other method of going through. And one of the reasons I went from Arizona to, to Germany was because of the good uh, paid position that they, they had there. And, um, you know, this sort of propels you across to <laughs> your sort of final destination, not to be, uh, not to be too, uh, too astronomical. But that's why one of my favorite quotes is, you know, telescopes make the best spaceships, because from my point of view, I have sort of been using it as a bit of a, a spaceship going forward and trying to, you know, uh, you know, explore the unknown, find out something that I didn't know before, maybe even find out something that, that nobody knew before. And even if it's just seeing a globular cluster that you've never seen with your own eye for the first time, this is the kind of exploration that can really, really capture you. And, um, you know, it's, it's something to recall, especially when we're looking in astronomy, Astronomy is something that you can share with everyone. And that's one of the great things about, about York. So if you're going through it and thinking, you know, this isn't working, I'm not interested in this, it's boring, then that's a bad sign. <laughs> so watch out for that. Um, and keep in mind that there are, you know, a lot of times um, interesting alternatives that you can, uh, that you can use. And so by not necessarily searching for the standard path, uh, search for, you know, the one that's going to work for you. Um, and I think I have a couple examples of that probably. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I found was very helpful was that I, I could identify that I really wanted to do my own research. I wanted to develop my own program. And so if you're thinking that might be you, um, then look for a place that will let you do your own research versus if you're thinking, oh, I, I really want to join a research program that's already going on. Well, then you have a, a very different goal. So, you know, it's all a matter of uh, analysis, I suppose, <laughs> um, cost benefit analysis, and then pick the one that you think works best for you. I mean, we can always be, uh, you can always end up, oh, I don't know, in the middle of the California desert with a car on fire and no phone, um, which has happened. <laughs> but, you know, this is why, uh, you know, say it can be difficult, but there's a, there's a method to the madness, as I say. Um, I'm not sure if that actually answers your question, but it's yeah, probably yeah. as close as I'll be able to get. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I just really wanted to say thank you for answering all of our questions. And this has really been helpful, again, to all of us who are students in astronomy and physics and really gives us hope for the future and a, sort of an idea to, to follow in this path. Absolutely. And I will say one thing, especially to a lot of the students who are starting off is um, you will have heard from a lot of people that there's there's a path forward. It's a you know bachelor's, a master's, a PhD, and then a research position. But that wasn't the case for me. And it won't be the case for a lot of people that you know. Um, and your own path forward can be wildly different from this and it's it's totally fine um, you never know where your next great opportunity might come from um, it it helps to be you know a bit stubborn but it also helps to talk to other people and to ask folks you know what's available and realize that you're always in a dynamic changing environment and this is true of us humans but also true out there in the universe at large um, things change on you know uh, local and galactic scales so you know if you hear back from people 
about what's changed recently. When I started off looking for PhD situations, um, uh, I actually was in a, in a position to see just how much it can vastly change based on, based on country, based on state, based on a research topic. You might find one, one year in one place at one time, there's absolutely no positions in what you're interested in. And, um, you know, three years later, it might be the, the biggest booming field ever. So it's, it's always um, in flux, I should say. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's, uh, uh, it does help to, uh, to keep that in mind and to try reaching out and talking to people, even if it's somebody that you wouldn't normally talk to if you're out there, uh, you know, searching for your own way, uh, your own way forward. And it's, uh, um, it helps to have that scientific mentality as well. So if you treat it as a bit of a research project, that's always, always fun. Um, but yes, it's been wonderful being on tonight. And uh, I think, um, uh, you know, we're, we're probably running a little bit, a um, little bit towards the end of time. Um, let me know if you'd like me to uh, put on the, the short tour. For sure. Feel free to do it. Uh, we would love that. All right. So just as maybe a nice way to end off tonight, of course, it is cloudy tonight and um, we are social distance still here in Toronto, but I do have a, a short tour video that I was able to um, to record earlier this year at the observatory. So I thought, you know, since I'm here tonight as the director, it might be nice to take everyone on a little bit of a tour. So I'll just go ahead and set that up here. Um, and I'm just going to steal your screen for just a second, and then you'll probably want to steal it back. All right, so this is my, um, my online tour, and I'm just going to turn off my video so you don't all see me twice. But this is a, just a little bit of a walkthrough for, from the observatory um, uh, just earlier this year. All right, hello everyone. Welcome, I am Professor Elena Hyde and you are here today at the Allen I. Carswell Observatory on York University campus. We're very excited to be here with you and we're here on the third floor of the Petrie building, just walking across the walkway here up to the telescope. And as you can see, as we go upstairs, we'll be able to access the domes of the telescope inside the observatory. And of course, we'll be able to show you the interesting telescopes and exactly what it is we do here. So join us for today for a little bit of a tour. Welcome everyone. As you can see, we have now come upstairs into the actual observatory itself. So here we are inside the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. And just to call out, this is what we call the warm room. So this is the little middle area that we're standing in right now, where the astronomers come to warm up in between looking through the different telescopes. And we actually have two telescopes, which correspond to the two domes that you can see from the outside. Our first telescope is our old tried and trusty 60 centimeter. The 60 centimeter has been in operation for quite a while, running all kinds of exciting research observing as well as occasionally public observing as well. We do, uh, of course, variable stars, SX Phoenicius, and lots of interesting th stuff. And in fact, the 60 centimeter has a brand new instrument being put on it called Quail, which is in the process of being built right now by some of our students and grad students. So I'm just going to go ahead and open the door here for you. Here we have the 60 centimeter, and as you can see, it is a little bit of an older telescope. It's oriented with what's called an altitude and azimuth drive to allow it to point up at the sky. And this telescope is, you know, uh, one of our, our oldest and truest sort of friends here. You can see by the amount of cabling and where it has in fact been around for a while, but it is still used every night that is clear uh, for research observing. So very exciting, wonderful telescope um, that we, uh, we love to use here at the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. Just on the side, um, the new shiny new pieces of chrome or aluminum, I should say, that is the new instrument, Quail, which is in the process of going onto the telescope now. 
All right, everyone. So now you can see that we're actually inside the computer part of the warm room. This is where we control the 60 centimeter as well as the one meter telescope that you're going to see shortly. And this is also where we broadcast our live images for, of course, our Monday night online public viewing, our Wednesday night teletubes, and any other time we want to share live images from the telescopes across to the public or our colleagues. So these telescopes get a, a lot of use every week here at the observatory, but um, the computers here probably get even more use because we very rarely turn them off. They're always running exciting new images and of course uh, lots of new data reductions and analyses as well. So this is uh, um, you know the warm room area and we have some heaters around. It does look a little messy but I can assure you we are social distancing. All right, everybody, now we have finally reached our pride and joy, the one meter telescope. This is quite a new telescope here at the observatory. And this telescope is why we are called the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. In fact, it was a, a donation from the Allen I. Carswell Charitable Fund, which allowed us to purchase this telescope, uh, I should say, not just last year, but 20, 2019 was when it actually arrived in the dome. Before, uh, we had a little tiny 40 centimeter telescope, which has actually been moved over to the atrium. This telescope has amazing pointing and beautiful imagery. So you might wonder why am I holding the, the planet Mars here? Um, this telescope is allowing us to view Mars opposition with absolutely unparalleled or I should say unprecedented detail for the observatory. So we can view planets and galaxies and also of course take lovely imagery which we can combine and make beautiful processed images of not just Mars but other planets or nebulae and even star clusters. We're looking forward to installing a spectrograph soon so watch this exciting space. Thank you very much for coming along with me on this tour of the Allen I. Carswell Observatory. This concludes our little look around, but if you would like to reach out, you can find us on email at observe at yorku.ca, or of course you can visit us on social media with Twitter and Instagram at York Observatory and Facebook at Allen I. Carswell Observatory. You can also see our website at observatory.info.yorku.ca. Thanks for joining everyone. All right, so I'll just go ahead and uh, say that's the end of the uh, the official tour there. So I hope you all enjoyed it. As you can see um, from that tour, the clouds are actually a reasonable um, re a reasonable reproduction of the clouds tonight, which is why, of course, we cannot do our live imaging support. So I suppose I'll take one more uh, question that's just popped up in chat. Um, we did have one extra question come in from, from Grant about the free online courses that I, I recommended and bachelor's degrees. So one thing you will uh, you you might not know is that bachelor's degrees can be uh, very different requirements at different universities in different states and in different countries. And what they accept um, as transferable credit can change um, depending on their, uh, their requirements. So you can get, uh, you know, into trouble transferring credits across on many, many different levels. But generally speaking, if you're doing a free online course, unless they actually offer you a university credit for it, um, it will be very, very hard to get it accepted as a transferable credit into a degree program um, because they, they, you know, they can't quite match it up uh, is usually what happens. Um, so I don't know of any cases offhand where that is uh, possible, but I do know of, in Australia they had a few um, which were pure online courses which were run through universities and those usually will be um, transferable, but tend not to be um, tend not to be free. So, um, and uh, yeah, I suppose we're we're just about out of time here. So um, I should probably think about passing it back. But as a as a way of introductions uh, um, to to uh, to people, I'll just say um, it's great to be here. So uh, you know, live long and prosper, <laughs> and uh, um, feel free to to uh, reach out to me at the observatory and send me your observing ideas, astronomy puns and any astronomy cat pictures you might have. So I'll just go ahead and hand back to you, Matt, if you can capture that screen share.
Well, everyone, you've been listening to the Alan I. Carswell Observatory's weekly tele broadcast, the Astronomy and Astrophysics program, written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening were Matt, Tina, and myself, Shannon, and a special thank you for Professor Elena Hyde for joining us today. Make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comments section of the video and talk to us in the chat right now. We'll be around for the next 20 minutes to answer your questions. All of our programs are free, but if you'd like to make a donation, see our website at observatory.info.yorku.ca. You can always connect with us on Twitter with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact info at observatory.info.yorku.ca. Thanks for tuning in. Clear skies and have a great day.